to another episode of Chanel in the City on iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Chanel Amari, and we got a special guest in the building today. I know you guys are obsessed with this show because it's my favorite show. That's right. We got Gabriella Baragon, the second stew from Below Deck Sailing Yacht, one of the hottest shows right now on Bravo TV airing every Monday night at 8 p.m. So I don't know what you guys are thinking, but you better be watching. Please help me welcome <laughs> my beautiful, my talented, my hard-working friend, Gabriella Baragan. How are you? Am I pronouncing I'm your good. last name right? Almost. It's Barragan. Barragan. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Chanel. Thanks like for having keep, me. How are you? I like to, you know, add a little <laughs> Latina, you know, accent yes. to because I'm Latina. Are you, what's your nationality? Yeah, so I'm half Mexican and half Black. So my last name actually has an accent on the last A, so it'd be Barragan. Barragan, Barragan that's what I wanted to say it like that. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> nice. You nailed it that time. I love it. And let's talk about, first of all, congratulations on long, the longevity of the Low Deck Sailing Yacht and the series and this season especially. How does it feel also to represent, you know, with everything going on in America right now and the cultures and just like, you know, for me, for a long time, it was hard to admit because I, I, you know, my mom's Colombian, so I'm half Spanish and I'm half Israeli Arab. And it was very hard to admit in America when you want to be accepted by everyone, right? White people in mm -hmm. general. Um, yeah. Your roots. How, how does it feel, though, to be representing that now on national TV for the Spanish and the black community? Yeah. Um, thanks for asking. That's a very important question. Um, I don't think people understand the added pressure when you go on a TV show and you work on an industry that's predominantly white, um, how much extra pressure is added on you to be better at your job, to know more, to be faster, to be smarter, to be more efficient. And um, that's a lot of the things that, you know, sometimes your counterparts at your place of work don't have to think of. They just simply have to be there. Um, so it was really nice for me to be able to represent my community as best that I could under all the pressure. Um, and, you know, being biracial, especially in America, you don't always grow up feeling like you belong to anyone or anything. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that my father had a lot of Mexican pride and my mother, you know, studied um, African-American studies in college. So they were able to let me learn about and be proud of both of my sides equally. Um, so it is something that I always keep in my mind when I'm at work or when I'm just carrying myself in, in public and everyday life that that's just unfortunately something we have to think about. And I think that I did represent myself well on the show, but that's just who I am. My father is a very hard worker. He's an immigrant from Mexico. Um, so I saw him working hard his whole life. My mother, the same thing. And it's just been instilled in me at a young age to just do your best, be the best and work your hardest. Yeah, I love that. I'm so excited. We, I love you on the show. Talk to me about the experience of like, because there's the, it, we have all, all industries, right? Types of industries, but working on a boat is a very specific, I think, type. And so a lot, seems like a lot of hard work, seems a lot of, like a lot of fun. Talk to us mm -hmm. about though, like, what is your daily routine really, you know, on the show, off the okay. show? Okay. So yachting is very exclusive industry. What people are paying for are anonymity and privacy mm. uh, because it's a very intimate work setting you get to you know everything about your clients and your guests down to their dietary restrictions the medications they're on um what they do for a living so like you're, you're trusted with all of this private information so it's very important to be professional and to keep their privacy um but it's really just like nine to five when i when i'm not in the middle of a charter it's you know usually like eight to five you know, Monday through Friday. Hopefully I'll have the weekends off, but it depends on whether you work private or charter. Um, so it's all about routine. You get up every morning and you do the same thing in the same order every day to a point where it becomes muscle memory. So as a second stew, I would get up at eight um, or be on deck at eight. And then I would start dusting from top to bottom, oh, wow. right? Then I would go back up with the vacuum and vacuum from top to bottom and wipe down everything, clean all the windows top to bottom, top to bottom. Then you go, you work your way into the guest cabins and do the same thing. Oh, like, that's a lot of work. That's <laughs> a lot it's, of it's, work. Yes, because it's, a, you know, they're big boats. So running up and down those stairs with a big uh, miele vacuum and, 
you know, all your little tools and your, and your stew caddy. It's just a lot. And it's the same for the exterior. You get up, you're on deck at eight and you wash the boat top to bottom. Soap, rinse, dry, repeat on every single level. Once the boat looks sparkly clean, then you can work on projects like organizing, inventory, provisioning, and stuff like that. And um, But generally, it's pretty repetitive, <laughs> like every day. So, so to me, chartering is the exciting part because you get to learn and relearn a new group of people every week or so, sometimes two, and you just start, the rat race starts all over again. And I like that excitement and the fast-paced environment that that you know, gives me because I like variety. Yes. You know? And like your, I feel it keeps you constantly stimulated on your feet, always thinking. It's mm-hmm. also like a good survive. I always say when I watch the show, like, damn, if I was on this boat and worked, I would have the tools for surviving life. Like, think about <laughs> it. If you guys got lost on an island, you would be able to get yourself out of it. It's consistency. It's muscle memory. It's just like, yeah, it's it's the way of survival. I think that it's good training. Yeah, it really life. is. It's just, it is life training. Absolutely. Um, navigation, what to do in, in a scary situation and how to think on your toes and keep, stay calm and keep yourself and others safe. Um, even like down to table decor and throwing parties. Like, you know, one day when I have my own mansion and I'm inviting everyone over for dinner, I'm going to be able to decorate and go get all the food and cook and do all of the things that I saw my mother doing growing up. I'm like, dang, mom, you did this for free? Yeah, You're crazy. I know. I'm like, like, this is hard. Wait, you sleep <laughs> like, for my dad my for laundry. free? Oh, hell no, not in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. Like, I'm getting paid for doing laundry and right. cooking and cleaning and babysitting badass kids, you know? Hell yeah. Uh, so that just shows the pureness and, like, what a saint she is because I don't know if I could do that for free. Let me just say that right now. But, you know, it does. I, I joined the industry when I was like 30 or 31, right? So, but the only time I was a third two, I messed up the laundry. I wasn't very domestic, you know? Yeah, I feel <laughs> and, you. And I, I try to make a joke of it. And the, the chief stew was like, you don't have to be domestic. You're 31 years old. You should know how to do laundry. It's a life skill, not a stew skill. And I was like, touche. Like, Noted. That's actually like a good advice. She's right. She's right. But I have, you know, people commenting on the DMs like, I don't even know how to put a fold a fitted sheet on my bed, or I don't even know how to fold my clothes. So I'm, I know I'm not alone out there. Right. You're but not, now I can I do all of that stuff. I definitely don't know stuff. how to do laundry, and even when I try, <laughs> I screw it all up. It's like bleach centrals. I'm sorry. I think one time I said like just to be funny because I like to when I'm embarrassed, I'm like, let me make a joke of this. Hurry up. <laughs> So um, I think I said something like, I come from big cities, you know, where I just drop it off at the fluff and fold and then they deliver it to my house. She's like, uh, and like walks away. And I was just like, I was just trying to be funny, but it's kind of true. Like, I'm LA, but we do do that in New York, New York City. Yeah, that's, that's normal. New York, I'm like, fluff and fold, let's go. I'm not doing this. I'm too busy. I have things to do. Exactly. Yeah, I always, I, it's interesting to me, since you do come from the work mentality, the hard work mentality, why do yeah. you think it's hard for, and you have a lot of rich people or VIP people or celebrities on the boat. I don't know. I've been realizing this. Why do you think it's hard for people to understand luxury or like comprehend it? Like, why do people get so angry? It's almost like, oh, I'm dropping my laundry at, at this. Oh my God, you're spoiled. You don't know how to do anything. Like a lot of ignorance comes out from that. And no one like, you know, I don't know where that comes from. Where do you, why do you think that happens? Cause you work hard and Sometimes you have to drop your laundry off. That's just Honestly, a part of life, right? When I was bartender in New York City, like just the thought of walking to the laundromat with all my bags of clothes in two degree weather in the snow, slipping on black ice. I slipped down the stoop once and dropped all my stuff. Like, and still have to go to work tonight and bartend till two or three o'clock in the morning. Like, I'm not going to do that. I'm just not going to do it because it's, it's really hard. And these people are getting paid to do it and they're happy to do it because they're making a living. Right. And, um, I can, I can spare that in my budget to do it. It doesn't mean I'm spoiled or incompetent or anything. It's just, I've never had to learn because I left the house at 21 and my mom pretty much did my laundry until then. Cause she yeah. loves me so much. And then I went to LA and did the fluff and fold stuff. And then New York and did the fluff and fold. Like, because it's a luxury to have a washer and dryer in your house, first of all. Yeah. When you live in those types of places, you don't. So you just adjust, you adapt to whatever you have to do. I don't think there's anything wrong with it um, at all. I don't know where that mentality comes from. I just, I don't know. I 
think it's a bunch of people that, yeah, I think sometimes it also comes from a mentality of people who want it really easy or people who really want it easy in life, but say they want to work hard for it, but they don't. And they just don't understand that luxury comes with hard work. You're allowed to enjoy luxury with hard work or something that's convenient for you. It's not the end of the world. I do do notice that, you know, now that I work around actual billionaires and millionaires, once you make a certain amount of money, you don't have to pay, you don't have to do anything anymore. You have to run your company and go on holiday. Yeah. And I think that's what everyone aspires to anyway. So I don't judge. Yeah. I don't judge. I'm like, I, I told this once on another podcast that like uh, the craziest thing I had to do was to, the, the missus asked me to come into her bedroom every two hours at night and apply cold sore medicine to her lips and Vaseline in her nostrils throughout the night. No and way. I, I did it. I did it. Again, I was the third two. The only time I was the third two, I swear, that was boot camp, stewardess boot camp for me because I was doing the craziest stuff. My second suit was 19 years old, telling me what to do. That must have been hard. Oh, wait, I can't hear you. I think the audio, can you hear me? Sorry, the audio, can you say that again? Yeah, I said, let me see if I can connect to my AirPods. Yeah. Did that work? Yeah. Okay. I just said, um, can you hear me? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. I had to learn, I learned the most um, when I was a third stew, the one time it was my second boat. And, you know, my chief stew was the same age as me. The second stew was 19. And, you know, they like the, the second stew was nice, but the chief stew was like, you know, very curt and very direct and very, you know, get it together. But she got me up to speed. And because of her, I I do have high standards now. And I got it from her. And like, if I wouldn't have worked on that boat, I wonder how far I would have gotten, to be honest, because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, and I was trying to get by through YouTube. Well, on that note, what made you want to become a stew on a boat? You know, what inspires someone to do that? Or You know, because for me, like, I want to do it now because I feel like I've talked to a lot of you from the cast, and I mm-hmm. become friends, and it looks really fun and cool, and I want to yeah. work. And so what do you work in something where you can learn a whole new industry that's really cool to serve people? Like, because I come from hospitality, so that would be an easy yeah. transition. But how did yeah. one get into it? Like, tell yeah. us. Yeah, uh, well, exactly what you said. Um, I was working in hospitality for about 15 years mm-hmm. uh, as a waitress first and then a uh, bartender. But I worked my way up through every position over the years. Um, and then... I was like, I've never, even if I'm working in New York or Miami or LA, I'm not making enough money to save and right. travel. And I've always had the travel bug. So I just started like researching, like, hmm, how can I make money traveling? And of course, traveling bartender came up and I was like, I already do that. And I'm still not making money. So uh, Super Yacht Stewardess was on there and I, and I looked into it, the seed was planted. And then it still took me about five years before I really researched on how to get into the industry, where to start, how to get my courses done. But like you said, it was an easy transition in from hospitality to yachting. Um, but I realized pretty quickly in like my first uh, couple boats that I joined yachting to experience something different and to be challenged. Oh, I can't hear you again. I think it, it, it went out, sorry. I'm so sorry. It's okay. This, I think it keeps going. The hotel radio or something. Really okay, annoying. You could, you could start that sentence again. I'll, I'll edit it. Okay. Let me just try to forget this other device. Okay. Okay. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Okay. So you can hear me now. Yeah? Um, sorry, I had to switch legs too because I'm like shaking over here, holding the laptop. Um, what was I saying? So, at oh, the yeah. Second, yeah, the yachting so experience. Pretty, so pretty much after my second or third job, I was like, wait a minute, I'm doing the same thing I was doing on land, just on the water. Like I'm still taking care of people. I've been taking care of people since I was 17. Like, so I'm basically doing the same thing I've already been doing just on a boat. And I started to explore other options. So I started applying for jobs that, you know, that were not just interior, dual positions like deck stew or cook stew. Um, And girl, 
I was no cook, but now if someone asked me, sure, I'll do it. Um, but yeah, I was looking into other options being a deckhand. So I started doing a lot of day work as a deckhand, learning how to treat peak and like polish down a bow and do all that stuff. So I ended up gaining more skills than just being a stew or just being a, a head keeping or housekeeping stew, where on the larger boats, you really just have one job. And if it's service stew, you're always on service. Housekeeping stew, you're always in the laundry and you don't broaden your skill base that way. So I made it a point to put on my CV, I can do both wherever you need me, put me. And I'm confident in both areas, maybe not on Parsifal 3 because you need a little bit more qualifications as a deckhand, just a deckhand to, to operate a large sailing yacht like that. But um, uh, on a motorboat, I definitely could be a deckhand, a full-time deckhand with no problem. Um, chief stew, I'd probably do. Because um, a soul stew is basically a chief stew. It's just a smaller boat. So I've done that. So I've just, I've always been the type of person that I have to try everything before I decide where I fit or what I like the best. So I'm just going to keep going until I find a position that's perfect for me. Um, and that's just how I'm going to do it. I know it's not conventional in yachting. Usually you stick to one position, you eventually move up and then, you know, you retire from that position, but that's not my style. So I'm excited to see where I'm going to end up this summer, get a crossing back to Europe so I can um, get my captain's license. And, yes, you know, I'm learning girl. how to sail. I'm learning how to sail right now, like in the Caribbean. So, yeah. I'm, That's pretty I'm cool. Doing it my way. Wow, below deck Caribbean, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> with Captain yep. Gabriella Baraga, please. <laughs> um, with her uh, second suit, Chanel Amari. No, I'm just kidding. I always love to plug myself in. I just I talk love to that. myself. But no, but on that note, so that was my next question. The goal, what's the next goal for mm -hmm. you? I'm the same way as you. I like to try different things and then see where Ooh. I fit. I don't like when people tell me where to fit because you and I have gone through that our whole lives. Like right, exactly. I think Please. that's maybe the major part of the way I am. Um, people can say a lot about me, but they can't say that I don't do everything I say I'm going to do. Mm. Everything that I said I'm going to do, I'm going to, I did it already. And, and that's just how I keep living my life. Um, and yes, the fitting in, trying to get everyone's approval or validation or acknowledgement has been so exhausting. And I'm just, trying to get to a place in this industry where I don't have to constantly make people believe that I belong there just as much as they do because I do work my my butt off and my guests love me and I make strong connections with the charter guests and and some of my crewmates that I I still friends with to this day but I don't know I'm just I think I'm just breaking molds and I'm gonna get my sea time which is what I'm doing now and I'm gonna get my captain's license hopefully by the end of this year or the beginning of next year, just a small one, yep. just a beginner, it's a but goal. it's better than nothing. Yeah. We love <laughs> and it. And I'm going to keep do I'm going to. Oh, sorry. Finish your I, sentence. I was just going to say like, because I have so many skills and I'm like a well-rounded crewmate, I can literally help wherever. Um, I think that's just going to open more doors for me. So I'm not going to put myself in a box and follow the cookie cutter route of yachting. I'm going to do it my way. I love that. And I think that's what we love about you on the show, that we see you take your own lead in your own way and still get the job done. So there's a lot of rules in life. And we always try to, find, like you said, figure out these cookie cutter roles. And I think you're making a stand. That's why we thank you, because that's something important. I think it's important to stand out and, and have those boundaries. You know what I'm saying? Speaking yeah, thank of challenges, you. Um, what were some of the challenges you felt you faced this He's season? Polite. and in general with yachting, but also with your castmates, right? Because you're working and sleeping with them every day and you have a strong personality, but you're also like sweet like me. So what were the like challenges, I guess, for you? Um, the thing is, is that I think what's challenging is that we can't see what each other are doing at all times because we're on different levels of the boat, different rooms of the boat, all with our own personal tasks that we're trying to complete. So, um, you know, if I'm seeing things that Daisy doesn't see and Daisy's seeing things that I don't see or vice versa, it, and there's no, there's a communication breakdown, then it gets kind of difficult to work together as a team. So I think that on, on the interior this year, that's what we struggled with a lot. Um, 
Um, I've heard people saying that I had an ego and I was obsessed with my position, my title, which is completely false. Like, um, I just was, like I said, a lot of pressure to do a good job, um, to represent, and to and to do my past both a service by representing them well and showing the standards that I was given. And I don't think I was being like a lord, lording over Ashley, but that's how she received it and didn't hesitate to, you know, let anyone know how she was feeling about it. <laughs> but, and that's another thing. I wish I would have, I, the squeaky wheel is to get the oil. I wish I would have said something when I felt disrespected or undermined sooner instead of just trying to let it roll off my back because that ended up, you know, making me look bad or, or and blowing up in my face, really. And um, so trying to walk into like my first management role on a boat that size was difficult um, to try to, to make someone understand that I don't think I'm better than you, but I'm trying to help you and I'm trying to pass on the, the knowledge and the skills that I got on to help you be better at your position once you move on from here. That, that was where I was coming from, but um, you know, it's always that thin line, especially when you're a person of color where people just don't want to take your instructions and they, they don't want to listen to you. They don't, you know, they don't respect you. And I, I felt a little bit of that, but that's just how I perceived it. And um, it's unfortunate because I was really just trying to have a good time, trying to make friends and trying to do a good job. And it just didn't, it, it seemed like it was an uphill battle at some time, Where do some you, point. No, that was beautifully said. Where do you stand with Ashley now? And like, some of the staff that you've like where do you think it's gonna go I guess where do you see it heading with all of you um I'm I'm cool with pretty much everyone I I don't speak to Ashley I never have um after this after the show uh, she never reached out to me to apologize for how she acted or um she's never tried to be friends with me or or even explain her her point of view and it's interesting now seeing it from you know what she told Colin she opened up to Colin, she's opened up to Tom, she's opened up to everyone, but she just didn't let me in to where I could maybe be a little bit more compassionate and maybe take it a little bit easy on her in certain ways. Like, okay, she grows up in a competitive environment. She, maybe she's around a lot of mean girls and, you know, I could have helped her do that because I dealt with that my entire life. And I've surrounded myself with strong, beautiful, amazing, supportive women now, but it was a life I had to seek out and curate to take those toxic people out of my life. And, you know, if she would have opened up to me, I could have given her some sound advice and we could have been the best of friends, you know? Yeah. So I will say that my feelings are hurt still um, because I'm seeing stuff I didn't see before. Um, I'm sure everyone on the show feels the same way. So it's not like, oh, woe is me. But it's just like, oh man, I, I feel like I was so naive that I didn't even, I didn't even know what was going on. I didn't even notice it because I don't live in that world anymore, right? you know? Right. Um, so I feel dumb. I feel stupid. And I feel uh, like I was disrespected and undermined a lot. And it's like, it bothers me. So it'd be nice. I'd be open to having a conversation with her eventually, but um, I'm not going to reach out. <laughs> I'm like, I'm living my, my best life. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, it's, it's all good. Yeah. You know, Daisy well, and I chat often. That's how you deal with, I feel like, uh, you know, not to say she's a mean girl, but I've dealt with mean girls mentality, or maybe you can give us one tip of how to deal with, because we talk about mental health on the podcast before we wrap up. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with a mean girl mentality and how do you rise above it? It is the hardest thing for me. So if you can share yeah. some wisdom. Oh, it's so hard. Um, it took me the whole time after filming and before the show aired to even process that experience, um, um, the mean girl thing. I think that you have to understand whose validation you need. And most of it comes from yourself and the people you surround yourself with. I'm not saying surround yourself with yes women and yes men that just blow smoke up your ass every day. I'm not saying that people that love and respect you that are willing to be honest with you, even if you're doing something wrong or saying something wrong, Oh, it cut out. Sorry. I can't. I don't even know what that is. Um, Bluetooth device. So annoying. Ah. Oh. 
sorry. Um, I'm just saying you have to surround your people that actually love and respect you, that are willing to be honest with you and hold you accountable, keep it real with you, and help you become a better version of yourself as well as you them, you know? Hyping your friends up. I'm the biggest hype girl ever. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I think when I was younger, I um, downplayed myself a lot so I wouldn't intimidate other people. Same. And I, I had to dim my own shine a lot so other people wouldn't get intimidated by me. And it took a toll on my self-esteem and my mental health throughout my life. So I've worked really hard the past four years to work on myself and empower myself so I can then empower others and respect myself so I can respect others. I love myself so I can love others. So it's really just about working on you and surrounding yourself with better people. Honestly, for me, if I'm at a job where people don't appreciate me, they put me down, they treat me like crap, I don't care how much money I'm making, I'm out, you know? Yeah, you're right. You got to take so that you have step. To, that's the step you got to take for yourself. I think that's yeah. where you're like, oh, I know my value. I know how to love myself now. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, walk away with your head high and like dignity. I've I worked on job, like my dream boat one time. Oh my God, I was so excited to be there. But I was feeling bad vibes these like whole time. And I was working my butt off. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that I was sad every day. And that's not normal because you have to, in the audience, you live where you work. So you can't go home at the end of the day and go hang out with your real friends and just blow off some steam. You have, you have to like internalize it. Sleep, sleep next to people that like you don't even like or you know don't like you and so it's really important to maintain your own dignity and self-respect and your boundaries and so choose a better position choose better friends and uplift others I love that that's beautiful advice like I love having guests like you on my show because I learned oh. so much from you you know not only on the show I've learned from you to be a harder worker, to be a better person. I think that's important because it's so easy to be a shitty person. I realize that it's so easy to take the, 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 the devil's road. You know, it really is. It is. It's oh easy. yeah, it is. It's and hard I to struggle be like with a that. Good I struggle with the angel and the devil on my shoulders Always. once a week. <laughs> Girl, I got my mom yelling at me in Spanish on one hand and my dad like, that's how I feel. Like I'm like constantly battling, you know, because yeah. to be, because to have boundaries, sometimes as a woman, you have to be assertive and that's not, accepted but well I know that when I don't when I let people disrespect me that I don't feel like I show up for myself mm -hmm. and the pain that I'm feeling is from me letting myself down not from what the person actually did or said yeah. so that's the biggest thing that I've, I'm trying to be mindful of and you know I have to because you know where we come from people can't talk to you a certain type of way because oh, yeah. they'll, they'll catch you can mm -hmm. but like taking the high road which is what all my friends and family are telling me. Sometimes it feels like I'm getting punked and I don't like that feeling. I don't like to like taking advantage of or being made to feel weak. I hate that. Same. But I'm really, really, really trying to work on it because the only person that needs to show up for me is myself. So Amen. that's where I'm at right now. And that's what I keep in mind every time I see the episode. I'm just like, hmm. Pleasantly surprised about how you handled that, Gabby. Yeah. You, actually grew up, you actually grew up a little bit. Wow. I love it's it. So weird. <laughs> yeah, I always say reality TV because I did real. I did one season on Bravo, and mm -hmm. I it was the best season of my life because it was the most therapeutic thing. I feel like you look, you get to look at yourself in the mirror and know what you want and what you don't want out of life, and what you want to fix about yourself and what you're cool about with yourself. Yeah, it's the best thing. Yeah. Well, I'm there. We're still we're still in the beginning. I'm just like, oh God, oh no. But also like, okay, you yeah. go, girl. Yeah. Well, before we They're wrap up, uh, what do you? If, what do we? What can we expect as viewers for the rest oh. of the season to tune hmm. in? Hmm. Trying to find the light. Uh, <laughs> um, She's like me turning into Beyonce, but that's besides <laughs> <laughs> me turning right? into the captain. But besides say. that, <laughs> um, I honestly, viewers can expect just it to continue to get wilder and wilder. Just when you think you can't get any wilder, it will, and it does. Um, relationships forming left and right, um, you know, safety issues, as you guys saw in the preview this past week. So it's just the guests get funnier and funnier as well, cooler and cooler. So it's going to be super, super entertaining. We can't wait. Tell us also one place we should all check out, Chanel in the City. What's your favorite place, whether it's 
where to yacht to, like a, a city, a country, or a restaurant, favorite place of yours that we should check out? Ooh, I would say that if any of the viewers are going to Spain this summer, which I highly recommend, uh, go to Palma de Mallorca um, on the larger island and take like a day sail on a sailboat around and go snorkeling, eat all the meats and cheeses and drink all the wine. And that's where you need to be in the summer. Well, hands down. More than the Caribbean, more than New England. I'm saying like you need to be in Spain for the summer. Well, we're going to take your advice on that. Honestly, I love you so much, Gabriella. You were so amazing. I oh, wish I had even more you. time with you. Um, where can everyone follow you? Thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for sharing your life with us and all your knowledge with us. We can't wait to keep tuning in. Guys, every Monday night, Below Deck Sailing Yacht at 8 p.m. on Bravo TV on your TVs. And you can watch this beautiful, amazing human being who can, you can learn from, Gabriella Baragon. She has a lot going for her. And where can they follow you on social media? Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at underscore little Gabby. That's Gabby with one B and little proper, not like Lil Wayne. Um, I'm on Twitter now. I have like two followers. Um, I'm sailing Gabriela with one L. <laughs> and um, I think that's it. Yeah. Instagram and uh, Twitter. Love you know, that. I'm older, girl. I'm not, I'm not really up on all of the socials like that. Same, but I'm my 30, Instagram's popping now. Yeah, and I'm more of an Instagram girl. I'm 37 years old. I'm like, uh, TikTok, I do too. And uh, sometimes I act like I'm 16. But <laughs> I can't. You know. I, can. I like to watch them, but I just can't. I can't I keep know. up. You're like, I'm gonna, I have a serious job. I can't be doing... Well, it would be cute to see all you and the staff do a cute TikTok um, on the boat. Like, that would be cute, like, I think for the audience. Ooh, I think see. that we did do one with one of our charter guests that they they will post when okay, their episode good. comes out. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited for that. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's your girl, Gabriella Berrigan from Below Deck Sailing Yacht, Season 3. You're listening to me on Chanel in the City podcast with Chanel Omari. Stay tuned. <laughs>